that every muscle in its body has its own communication pathways or own set of battery cables. Like you look at this, the vastus medialis, I mean, you see the VMO in the bottom in the quad and it's separated by fascia and then you have a larger version of the vastus medialis and you have basically four different divisions of the vastus medialis that are all separated by fascia. And they all, each one of those four divisions have its own set of communication pathways. And then you see the adductors, the sartorius, the hamstrings running behind. Every one of those muscles that are separated by fascia have their own set of battery cables and communication pathways with the nervous system. So with muscle activation techniques, we basically have the ability to assess the function of every one of those muscles. But now we're going to go into movements. Muscles move bones and muscles hold bones in proper alignment. Individually, there's no such thing as an isolated exercise. Like you can't say, I'm just going to work the clavicular portion of my pec. You don't work all the divisions of your pec. You can put an em emphasis on the clavicular portion, but you, if you were bench pressing or doing dumbbells on an incline to, to work the clavicular division, you'd have muscles throughout your whole body. Your core has to stabilize, your pec muscles, the different divisions of the pec, they all have to work. So you have to think of movements as opposed to isolated muscle function, but the movement, integrated movement is only as good as the function of its isolated parts. So we'll go through and we'll be able to assess the integrity of every isolated muscle, but we have to determine what do these muscles do? So that's the first thing you wanna ask. When we talk about glute and abdominal training, you have to ask yourself, what do these muscles do? If they were cont to contract, because muscles move bones, and muscles hold bones in proper alignment, if these muscles were to contract, to fully shorten, what would they do? So if we look at just in the core, in the abdominal wall, it's like movements that we can go to. The structure dictates function, but the, stru the, the function of the muscles dictate whether or not the structure can move the way it's designed to move. So there's a, the structure dictates in the lumbar spine, you have very based on the structure and you have the articular processes that line up against you and another. And basically from a lumbar spine standpoint, we have very limited amounts of motion in the lumbar spine. But as you move up the thoracic and into the cervical spine, as you move in the, cer the cervical spine, those articular processes are more horizontal, which allows for significant amounts of range of motion. So the structure dictates how much motion you can have at each joint. The function of the muscles dictate whether or not you can move through those ranges. So if you look at the core and we think, what are the muscles that support the core? You got the abdominal wall, you got the spinal erectors, you got the muscles oblique, the quadratus lumborum. You have all these muscles that support the spine and, and I, I call it like a functional girdle that are all there to create stability around that spine, but they also have to move the spine and they have to move the spine through its motion. So you think about one main motion, is the muscles in the core are responsible for creating spinal rotation. Then another motion, I mean, you got the rectus abdominal muscles, they lie more vertical, that they're responsible, their primary function is to flex the spine. And then you got the opposite, you got spinal extension. So you have rotation left and right, you got flexion, and then the opposite motion is extension, and then you have side bend left and right. These are the, I mean, you can get a combination of all these motions. With side bend in the spine comes rotation. With rotation comes side, opposite side bend. And so these motions combine with one another, but the main movements that actually occur in the spine are rotation, flexion, extension, and side bend. And there's muscles that are designed to perform each one of those functions. There's muscles in the body that have the primary function that you said, if this is what you're asking me, what do I do? I side bend the spine. What do I do? I flex the spine. What do I, the obliques do? I rotate the spine. So every muscle has a predominant function based on its alignment and based on the, the alignment between its origin and insertion. And then you have hip flexion, hip extension. Um, so when we talk about the glutes, they got the asterisks because hip flexors are the antagonist to the glutes. So if the glutes and hamstrings are weak, uh, the hip flexors tighten up. So you got agonist, antagonist motion, hip flexion, hip extension. So we got the glutes and hamstrings on, on that hip extension side of it. So we have to ask, what do these muscles do? And can they perform the function that they're designed to do? And the question is, how do we know? From a muscle activation technique standpoint, like I said, we have the ability to test to say, oh, and if you're a spinal rotator, can you resist a force in spinal rotation? If not, then there's a problem. There's altered communication due to inflammation, which we need to address.
But from a key standpoint, these are the main motions we have to consider when we're looking at glute and abdominal training. But that key of what I said is what do these muscles do? So the rectus abdominis, you got four divisions of the rectus abdominis that are all separated by fascia, but they're all integrated. The fascial attachments are basically, I mean, you still have the alignment, a vertical alignment of the rectus abdominis on each side. And those muscles have one, prime, one main primary function and that's to flex the spine. If they fully shorten, the spine will fully flex. If they fully lengthen, the spine will fully extend. And so if they can't fully lengthen, it will limit the amount of motion in, in spinal extension. And if they can't fully shorten, it will limit the amount of motion in spinal flexion. So I bend down to touch my toes. If I have altered communication between the nervous system and the muscle system, and or I haven't trained my abdominals correctly, because I said, if you don't use it, you lose it. If you haven't trained the abdominals to move through spinal flexion, the rectus abdominis muscles, you will lose the ability for those muscles to contract efficiently. And the opposite muscles, i.e. the spinal erectors, will tighten up. So sit-ups, I mean, can be a great movement. We've gotten away from the movement um, type of core training. I mean, sit-ups, I mean, what do we do? We do crunches. Think about what happens when we do crunches. Are we fully flexing? Are we fully shortening uh, this whole abdominal wall? We're just doing these. That's like doing bicep curls like this, taking the last 10 degrees or the first 10 degrees of motion and saying, I'm just going to do, I'm just going to do bicep curls and doing 20 degree, 10 degree ranges of motion. We know we're going to work the muscle to its full range of motion. But when we do core stability or spinal neutral training, we're keeping those muscles in one position and saying, now let's lift the arm, let's lift the leg, let's get those muscles to contract. Again, think about when you walk on ice. What do you do? You tighten up as a protective mechanism. So if you did EMG recordings and tried to say how much muscle activity is there, there'd be a lot of muscle activity in probably every muscle in the body because the body's doing anything and everything it can to try and tighten up and protect itself from slipping and falling. So spinal neutral training or stability training, i.e. putting on um, unstable surfaces, stability training can end up having the effect saying, I'll get increased EMG activity because anything and everything will contract. So we're gonna see, I mean, great spikes in, in muscle activity, but we haven't taught the muscles how to contract through their full ranges of motion, which means we haven't taught them how to stabilize through their full ranges of motion. Right now, we're just talking about the rectus abdominis muscles. Those are the muscles that have the primary function to flex you so that you can reach down and touch your toes. When I was young and started learning biomechanics and movement, I was told that gravity is what allows you to flex down and touch your toes. No, muscles contracting and muscles being able to shorten is what allows you to be able to touch your toes. And when I developed muscle activation techniques, I told you I was chronically tight. And when I was chronically tight, I mean, my abdominal wall was shut down and I could barely bend down to touch my knees. And the first time I got my abdominals and hip flexors, because the hip flexors are also muscles that can, the psoas can uh, flex the spine. When I got my hip flexors and abdominals activated, I bent down and touched my toes for the first time in 10 years because the muscles could fully contract. And then what I learned is I, I was doing everything wrong. I went through the rehab phase of it and I did all this spinal neutral training and everything, but I never taught my body how to move. And I never taught my muscles and my abdominal muscles how to, how to contract through their full ranges of motion and tolerate forces. And right now we're just talking about the rest, rectus abdominis. But I told you, we got a functional girdle. You see this shadow of these other muscles that, that come in. You have your internal and external obliques. Here's a picture of the external lateral fibers and, and anterior fibers. Uh, these, the anterior fibers of the internal and external obliques create spinal rotation, along with many other muscles. But the primary function of these muscles is to create spinal rotation. So if these muscles can't contract efficiently, it be, oh, I can't turn to the right. Ooh, I can't turn to the left. I have professional golfers that come in that have done all this core training. They come in and they can barely turn, I mean, one way or another. And rotation is the key motion to their, their function, to what they do. 
and they haven't trained themselves to be able to be strong through those ranges of motion. So they've lost range of motion, which transfers over to loss in club head speed, ball speed, and typically they're coming to me because they have low back pain, because their abdominal muscles are not doing their job to protect them from injury. They're rapidly trying to, I mean, hit the ball as hard as they can, as fast as they can, but their muscles aren't trained to tolerate those forces. They've never trained themselves through full range of motion in each of the planes of motion that these spinal muscles or these abdominal muscles are responsible for. So you have spinal flexion, you have spinal rotation, you have spinal extension and side bend. You have all the spinal erectors that are responsible for extension of the spine. You got the quadratus lumborum and many, the iliocostalis, multipedis that have more of alignment. Uh, we have these muscles that actually can create side bend in the spine along with the lateral fibers of the internal and external oblique. You have muscles that are designed to perform those functions. Those muscles need to be trained to do what they're designed to do, not to hold you in neutral, but to teach you to move. I need the side bend to the right. I need the side bend to the left. I need to rotate to the right. I need to rotate to the left. I need to flex. I need to extend. The muscles that move you into those positions have to be able to contract through those ranges, and they have to be strengthened through those ranges. So the neutral position is a great place to start, but you have to teach the body how to be strong through their full ranges of motion. Rectus abdominis flexion, you can do um, sit-ups, reverse sit-ups, reverse crunches, whatever, leg lifts. Uh, you can do any of the movements that are designed to fully lengthen and fully shorten the abdominal wall, the rectus abdominis, the anterior abdominal wall. Then you have to have muscles that are able to do the side bend. You can do, put them on a Roman chair and do side bending type muscles. And rotation, we have both an upper body rotation machine with a where the fixed axis of the pelvis and you're reproducing force through rotating the spine through the shoulder. Or we have another uh, piece of equipment where the shoulders are fixed and you have inverse of action, inversion of action where the pelvis rotates on a fixed thorax. So we're teaching the body and we teach our clients not only how to get the muscles activated and get them so they can tolerate and move through their full ranges of motion, then we follow up by strengthening them through their full ranges of motion. So many times from an abdominal standpoint, many times most people haven't trained themselves to move through the ranges of motion that the abdominals and spinal erectors and your core muscles are designed to move through. And when muscles can't contract efficiently, they can't shorten effectively. When you don't train the muscles to shorten effectively or train them through their full ranges of motion, over time, the opposite muscles tighten up and protect you from moving through the ranges. The first sign of neuromuscular weakness is tightness. The second sign is pain. And you will see anyone that comes in with pain in the low back, and um, you'll find that one or more of those motions, they can't move in. So tightness is the first sign of their neuromuscular dysfunction. Pain is the second. And most of the back issues that I see, I mean, I had a pro golfer that came in with a herniated disc and his abdominal wall was so weak. And it's like the rotation. The erector spinae muscles were, I mean, I'm sorry, the oblique muscles were so weak um, that they couldn't tolerate the forces of his golf swing. And he had a herniated disc. As we got the muscles activated and as we got his muscles stronger um, through great ranges of motion, he went on and he ended up, um, six weeks later, ended up winning on the PGA Tour. Uh, his motion came back, the pain went away, and uh, he was able to play and, and he ended up winning a tournament. And so muscles move bones and muscles hold bones in proper alignment. So that's a glutes. That, I mean, that's a, the abdominals. And so when you think about it, we go back to the foundation of core stability. We revert ourselves toward our center of gravity. If we train in the position that we revert to when we're dysfunctional, we're not doing anything to expand our horizon. I need to move. The body needs to move through all the planes that the structure dictates that it can move through, and the muscles have to be taught and trained to be able to do it. Uh, through MAT, we reestablish neuromuscular function, and then we follow it up with, with exercise. I always say there's no such thing as corrective exercise because we have to get the muscles activated, i.e. tighten battery cables, then follow it up with, with reinforcement exercises. But you have to teach the body to move through its full ranges of motion. First without load, then you can progressively add load. When you think of a strength and endurance standpoint, 
Um, I had a guy coming in that used to kind of come and his abdominals would be shut down. I mean, he golfs a lot and he'd come in and his abdominals would be weak all the time. And he'd be limited in range of motion. He had back pain. He's like, I do 75 crunches, I mean, three times a day. And think about that. That's rain. I mean, that's repetition. That's endurance. That's not strength. He's doing these, set, set, I mean, 75 crunches three times a day, but not only is it not strength, but he's not also not moving the muscles and training them through their full range of motion. When I test muscles, and when we test muscles through muscle activation technique, we don't test the muscles to see if they can contract and withstand force in neutral. We test them to see if they can withstand force in an extreme of range of motion. I'm going to have you fully rotate. Now prove to me that you can hold that shortened position of the rotators. And if in, you know what, when you're doing crunches all day long and now all of a sudden somebody takes you into the extreme and sees if you can withstand forces, the muscles show up as being weak. So the conversation I had to have with him is you have two problems here. You're doing 75 crunches, you're doing endurance training, you're not doing strength training. You need strength. These muscles need to be strong. We know in the exercise world, it doesn't matter whether muscles are predominantly slow twitch or fast twitch. There's a certain percentage of fast twitch fibers and a certain percentage of slow twitch, and you got to get the strength in the muscles. You can have all the endurance you want, but you have to have the strength through the great, through great ranges of motion. And then again, it's uh, the range of motion is the key. So we switched him over to an exercise uh, program where we're actually teaching his body to strengthen and under load to be able to do these ranges of motion. His strength levels have decreased or increased dramatically and he doesn't come down with his abdominal wall shut down anymore. His driving distance has improved. His range of motion has improved. And he's a 60 year old uh, man that, I mean, thought he was on a downward spiral with chronic pain. So muscles move bone, pain is an indicator something's wrong. The muscles move bones, and if they can't move the bones, then the opposite muscles tighten up, and other muscles then eventually they shout out in pain. We can improve muscle strength and ability to move through the range of motion. You decrease muscle tightness, you decrease pain. So that's the core. <laughs> then we got the glutes.